take a look at this. This is the Supreme Court's decision saying that Alabama's maps after the 2020 census were unconstitutional. And there's this interesting paragraph in here that we're going to focus on today. While the state says that the two million maps they simulated do not contain more than one majority black district, are race neutral, and therefore not violating section two of the Voting Rights Act, the court's decision says that the two million map samples, though a very big sample, are immaterial because the actual number of possible Alabama maps is, well, unknown. But according to experts in the case, it is in the trillion trillions, a number bigger than we can comprehend. Partisan gerrymanders used to be conspicuous. We're probably most familiar with gerrymandering through these oddly shaped districts that look like a salamander. That's where gerrymandering actually got its name in the 1800s, or my personal favorite, the I-85 district in North Carolina. We can pick them out more or less visually with our bare eyes and see some things just a little bit off. But now they're more subtle because in this effectively infinite universe of maps, there are some that look legitimate, but ultimately harm voters. And that's why the fundamental question of what makes a map fair or unfair, legal or illegal, has drawn sophisticated algorithms and the maps they simulate into courts across the country. And we get to look under the hood. is so much harder to years from now. Major networks project their taking control of the House in this midterm election. Let's start with a simple example. Say you have a state that needs five districts in this five by five grid. Each district needs to be contiguous, compact, equally sized in terms of population, and maintain existing boundaries. These can be precincts, census blocks, counties, cities, etc. We'll assume the population is split between two parties, a green party and a purple party. One way to do this is to split the grid proportionally. Races are competitive in this paradigm and the representatives have to work to earn the vote of their constituents. In other words, voters are highly empowered. But in the high stakes world of electoral politics, sometimes fairness might take a back seat. This has been especially true since the 1990s, when margins in the House have slimmed and competitive seats are few and far between, partially enabled by a rise in mapping technology. Voters that lean in one direction are packed into one district or broken up into multiple districts to dilute their voting power. Before you know it, you have a totally different balance of power. So in order to determine the fairness of a map, we need to sample from that effectively infinite universe of valid possible maps. In our 4x4 grid, the universe is pretty limited. We get 117 valid options, and that's manageable. But as we increase the size of the grid to 5x5, five five, wherein we need five districts, we have 4,006 valid options. At 7x7 seven seven with seven districts, we have 158,753,814 options. At 9x9 nine nine with nine districts, we have over 700 trillion options of valid maps. And by the time we reach 10x10 ten ten with 10 districts, we, we just don't know. You've heard of linear growth and you've heard of exponential growth, but this is a combinatorial explosion. And I've sort of buried the lead here that this is a simplification at that because you can move potentially diagonally between these blocks. Now swap out these very simplified grids for real precincts or blocks in a state. And this is why we need algorithms to sample from the space. Our algorithmic approach needs to consider the real world. States have different legal requirements for redistricting. Simulations have to be valid, which means they follow the requirements set out by each individual state. And that makes things a little complex. While some rules are shared across the board, like the requirements we used for our toy example with the grid, some have pretty unique and sometimes ambiguous requirements, like in Washington state, where ferry lines can establish contiguity. Virginia's constraint of only a 1% difference in population between districts, Colorado's designation that districts must preserve competitiveness, which is generally accepted as a maximum of eight points in favor of one party or another. 
All of these rules need mathematical representations or need to be encoded to be used in any algorithm. We'll start with the most straightforward, and that's compact random seed and grow. We'll head back to Alabama, which has seven representatives in Congress. But we have 67 counties, which we'll treat as if they get their own representatives to start. So basically, we're starting off with way too many representatives. What we need to do is merge the counties into a district until we get to seven representatives. To do that, we'll randomly pick or seed seven counties and merge adjacent counties until we have the seven we're looking for. We pick the adjacent counties based on the distance between geographic centers, so that's not a random part. We iterate the merging process again and again until we get our seven. This should make sure that we have contiguous and relatively compact districts, but it doesn't guarantee that the populations will be the same across the board. To fix that, Compact Random Seed and Grow looks at adjacent districts with too much deviation between them and finds a county that's furthest from the centroid of both districts and swaps it from the district with a greater population to the district with a smaller population. We repeat this swapping again and again too until we have parity. And at the end of the day, we have a map generated by Compact Random Seed and Grow. It's not perfect. The random seeds can cause bias if they initialize in urban areas, then extend into suburban and rural areas, causing voter dilution. But this also runs into a practical issue of time. Doing all these iterations and calculations can really blow up the time it takes to do this, even thousands of times. So we need a new approach. And that's why we have Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that are quickly becoming the standard. Now, Markov chain Monte Carlo sounds complicated out of the gate, so let's break it down. A Markov chain is just a sequence of events where the next step depends only on your current state and some probability of an outcome. A good way to think about this is with a board game. The only thing that matters on your turn is where you are and what you roll. Monte Carlo is just repeatedly trying something, doing a simulation, and keeping track of the output. MCMC for short comes in different flavors like recombination or recon. Now the thing about this one is we need to start with a previously created map and explore what happens if we recombine it. So we take adjacent precincts, we merge them into something called a spanning tree, we then just have to break one connection as long as it maintains population parity to get two new districts. And we can apply this across the districts. The big problem with recombination is we need to start with an initial plan, so there's a chance we're kind of blind to some of the possibilities in the absence of that plan, or if that plan is on its own biased. So we have sequential Monte Carlo. This time we don't need an initial plan or anything, we start off with one huge district. We create a spanning tree like our recombination approach, then make a split so we have two districts. One, which will be final, it's an actual district that we'll use, and the other will be split again. And we keep doing this until we get the right number of districts. There's an extra bit here that makes this approach more efficient and more complex. We won't go into the specifics of this formula, but sequential Monte Carlo basically looks at all our constraints and weights them to create a distribution of priors. Basically, the distribution a plan should fall into if it follows the rules. If it doesn't fall into that distribution, then the plan is rejected. Every time we iterate on this approach, those weights are updated. Now, the Supreme Court's not going to like have an expert wheel out these algorithms and explain them because I imagine they just don't have the time for that. So we need to distill the information from our simulations to something a bit easier to convey in a short period of time. For the ungodly number of simulations that these algorithms output, we need a histogram, a distribution upon which to put enacted maps in relation to their theoretical contemporaries. There's no prescribed standard by the Supreme Court yet, so the two that we'll use are partisan symmetry and the efficiency gap. Partisan symmetry is the basic idea that the proportion of the total vote should translate in a specific number of seats, regardless of party. So if the Green Party from our previous example won 60% of the vote and won three seats, we'd expect the Purple Party to have won three seats if they won 60% of the votes. If we can prove otherwise, there may be some 
breach or partisan bias. Therefore, we measure the deviation from perfect symmetry to represent who is favored under the enacted plans. The efficiency gap measures how many votes were wasted for each party in a state. Every vote over 50% plus one and under 50% or the votes for the losing candidate and the excess votes for the winning candidate is considered wasted. That difference between wasted votes for the green and purple parties can measure if votes are packed into a district, cracked across several districts. Mathematicians aren't just looking at maps and trying to figure out ways of judging fairness as an academic exercise, it's really important. There are outsized costs to getting this wrong or being slow. Election cycles, especially those for House representatives, pass very quickly. So politically biased maps create irreparable harm that can ultimately repeat after the next census. A lot of the discourse around fair congressional moves centers around independent commissions. These algorithms and independent commissions need one another. Equations that determine the fairness of a map are nothing without the independent commissions that put them into practice, and the independent commissions need the equations to determine what is fair in the first place. It might seem like overkill to go this in depth and pull out these fancy algorithms, but these are the literal building blocks of democracy. Like we discussed at the top, Fair maps free from political influence make for more competitive races, a more truly representative and responsive house, and a voter base that's highly empowered.